as we meditate, we try to stay with the body, because otherwise we're swimming around in our thoughts. Our thoughts are like many different currents in a river or an ocean. This current goes that direction, that current goes this direction. And it's hard to get any sense of what's right and what's wrong, what's skillful and what's not, until you can pull back and just be able to observe these things a little bit from the outside. In fact, the more you can observe them from the outside, the better. So staying with the body gives you an anchor and gives you a spot on which you can stand. It's like an island. The island doesn't flow down the river. It doesn't get pushed around by the currents of the ocean. And that way you begin to see, oh, here's a current coming in from that direction, here's a current coming in from this direction. But as you stand on the island, you don't have to flow along with the currents. Another reason for staying with the body, staying with the breath, is that it really does anchor you in the present moment. When you're with the breath, you know you're in the present. And often it acts as a good mirror for what's going on in the mind. Sometimes there are subtle currents that you otherwise wouldn't notice, but because they have an effect on the subtle aspects of the breath energy, you can detect that they're there. So a lot of good reasons for wanting to stay with the body. helps you observe thoughts or eyes pass away, and gives you something solid to hold on to. So as thoughts begin to subside, you're not lost. You're right here, where everything important is happening. The issue, of course, is that before thoughts begin to subside, you have to get through a tangle. To change the analogy, they're like lots of different thorny bushes. You get past one and you find that you're snagged. You have to go back and undo whatever's been snagging you. I was up in the North Rim this last week, and there are a lot of little locust bushes with lots of long thorns. And my old blanket was constantly getting caught. You have to stop, go back, and very carefully pull out that thorn, pull out this thorn. And I found that in doing that I learned a lot about thorns and I learned a lot about the weave of my blanket. And it's the same with dealing with distracting thoughts. We want to get past them, we'd rather not have to deal with them. And often we're very impatient when we get past this. And sometimes we do get past a particular thought, but then it comes back again. And it's very easy to get discouraged. But you've got to look at the distractions as an opportunity to gain understanding, to gain discernment, to pull back and see what's caught and where and why. You learn a lot of important issues about your own mind this way. So even though we are trying to get past our thoughts, still it requires patience and a willingness to learn, often the very lessons you don't want to learn about yourself. Some people avoid this by saying, well, I'll just accept whatever comes and whatever goes, and not try to get the thoughts to settle down. But you're never really going to understand them that way. You can observe a little bit, little flashes of things as they go past. But to really understand them, you have to resist them. And learn how not to get discouraged when they overcome your resistance. But just simply ask yourself, okay, what was it? Where was the weak link in my resistance here? So it's a combination of patience and persistence that we have to use with these thoughts. In the same way that getting my blanket untangled from the thorns required patience and persistence. If I was in too much of a hurry, the, the blanket would rip. And if I gave up and just left the blanket there, then I would be without a blanket. It was cold up there. So I needed the blanket, but I also needed to untangle it carefully. So always hold in mind the fact that this is a long-term project we're working on, and it's a very delicate one. 
You can't just rush through things. And it's also especially important not to get discouraged when you've worked through something and you find that it comes back again. This is not a sign that you've failed, simply that you learned one lesson, but there are other lessons you have to learn as well. Most of the problems we have in our lives have come from impatience. We're a very impatient nation. We're a very impatient generation. But the impatience often gets us into trouble. Sometimes wanting to do something quickly does give rise to quick results, and sometimes just messes things up. Understand? There's a internet company that has one of its slogans is "Move fast and break things." Well, that's not what we're doing with the meditation. We're not trying to break anything. We're trying to understand things, and that requires untangling them. Sometimes one thread at a time. When there's a particular instance of anger that comes up, sometimes it's many, many threads that are caught or that catch you, many, many thorns that catch you in your blanket. And when you've learned about one thorn, that doesn't mean you've solved the problem. Then when you come back and the other thorns catch you, okay, it doesn't mean that the first removing that first thorn was a failure. It was just one step in a very complicated process. The same with lust. You'll find that there are many layers to lust. Your attraction to a particular image, particular details in what you see. Your attraction just to the feeling of having lust. And they're all the little details. That's why the Buddha says when he's talking about restraint, you notice the details, the themes and variations. So the general themes. And then the little tiny things that can get you off. And it's not that you don't look at people or you don't look at anything at all, but simply you learn how to notice. Go, what are the things that attract you? Because that's where you learn some really important lessons about the power of perception. Certain perceptions have certain ideas associated with them. And it's all pretty arbitrary. After all, as the Buddha said, it's fabricated. You want to see these fabrications in action, because that's where ignorance lies, the, the big root that we're trying to dig out here. If you're unaware of the ignorance right now, we'll look for where your mind is fabricating something. And perception is a very useful one. After all, concentration itself is what the Buddha calls a perception attainment. You have to have a certain mental image of the breath in order to be able to focus on the sensation of the breath and to see it as a breath sensation. Many people have trouble right here. They say, well, I'm trying to focus on my body. Excuse me, I'm trying to focus on my breath, but I keep just coming back to being with the body. Well, what is the immediate sensation of the body but breath energy? It's a question of perception, seeing it that way. And when you begin to realize, okay, you can see it that way, or you could see it in other ways. And the question is, which perception is most useful? And you realize you have the choice. There are lots of different ways you can perceive things. It's like going to another country that has a different system of medicine and their whole analysis of diseases, the different categories of diseases they have and the way they've organized them and the way they treat them. There's a whole different body of perceptions that they have. And they're talking about the same things that happen to us here in America few variations, some different diseases that we don't have here. But many of the, the basic diseases are pretty much the same. But their way of categorizing them, their way of treating them, their way of understanding why they're there is very different. And instead of simply dismissing that as something strange, you learn from it and you realize, okay, there's that angle that you can look at things from. Once you get a sense of the power of perception in your concentration, then it's a lot easier to see it at work in your thoughts. 
how one particular perception can ignite anger, another perception can ignite lust or fear, greed, envy, and begin to realize how arbitrary these things are. That itself is very liberating. And so if you find that your, your blanket is snagged on the thorns, okay, just stop and very carefully take things apart one thorn at a time. Have the patience so you don't rip the blanket, but the persistence so that you actually get it free. An important part of the skill of the meditation is just that, knowing how to balance these things. This is one of the main ways that we develop discernment in the practice. Because so the practice was simply just going to the far extreme, whatever that extreme may be. It doesn't require much thought. It just requires a lot of pushing. As the Buddha said, his path is a middle path, and it's middled in lots of different ways. You have to figure out how much food is enough, how much food is too much if you're trying to practice, how much sleep is enough, how much sleep is too much, how much pressure to put on your object of meditation. If you don't put any pressure at all, you'll, you'll be flying away. If you put too much pressure and things begin to clamp down, you don't feel comfortable here. How much thinking is necessary, how much thinking is too much. As you engage in these issues, you find that you really do develop your powers of discernment. You develop a sensitivity to what's working, what's not, what's skillful and what's not. And this is where the discernment becomes your own. Because after all, it is your stress, it is your suffering that you're dealing with and the fact that you're causing it, and that these are things that you experience from within. You can read about these things and have all kinds of theories and have everything all correct that you can explain to other people, but if you don't actually see it happening within your present awareness, it's just perceptions. And even correct perceptions can hide things. If your gaze is not all around. So again, this is one of the reasons why we stay here with the body. You start by experiencing the body from within. You don't worry about how other people might explain what you're sensing here. You ask yourself, well, how am I sensing this? And we use the Buddhist categories of breath, energy, and earth, water, fire to help give ourselves a vocabulary for getting a sense of what's going on here. And then you begin to see your thoughts as they have an impact on the body and on your feelings. And as you get sensitive right here, you get more and more sensitive to where there's stress and where there's no stress, what kind of fabrication leads to more stress, what kind of fabrication leads to less stress. It's right here that everything becomes apparent, and apparent in a way that really does you a lot of good. So right here is where you belong.